we saw that he deserves preeminence in all things. Now today, we we'll see another reason why he deserves the preeminence in everything we do and say, uh, why he deserves preeminence in every relationship and activity. He deserves the preeminence because of how he reconciled us to himself. We read about it uh, in Colossians chapter 1, um, beginning in verse 20, where he, he is inspired by the Lord to write, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Now let's bow together for prayer. Dear Father, as we look at your work of reconciliation, I pray that you would fill us with a great gratitude and joy at the realization that you did it all. We thank you and praise you for the confidence that we can have, that we can come to you face to face because of this work of reconciliation. You have made things right. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see it from your perspective. Help us to see it clearly. I pray that you would fill us with joy and gratitude for what you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our reconciliation to himself is through the blood that he shed on Calvary. Now, in verse 20, he says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now, Romans 5.1 says that being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We learn that there never was a reason to oppose God at all, which is the mindset that we had before we were saved. And thus, when we recognize the price that he paid for us, and we make the decision to trust him as Savior, we have in our hearts peace with God. And it is through his blood that we are made at peace with him. Now, the peace of God that passes all understanding is that inner calmness that comes to the believer for trusting in him and the issues of life that we face. But the peace with God was made the moment we trusted Christ as Savior. Now, notice he says, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him emphasizes the fact that he did it all. Um, his redemption, this provision for us of reconciliation was in his mind from before creation. Uh, he purposed to offer himself to bring this peace to us. He worked to communicate his word to us. He inspired and preserved his word so we could have it today. He moved in someone to speak to us about our need to trust the Lord as Savior, and he worked to prepare our hearts to receive it so that he could bring us to himself. Now notice he says it is to reconcile all things unto himself. To reconcile all things to himself is speaking when he adds, uh, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. By him, he is saying he reconciled everything to himself. On the earth, we all, in our lives today, all of us have the opportunity to be reconciled back to himself. Notice, we are the one that need to be reconciled. Uh, he loves us already. Before we knew the Lord, we did not have any desire for him. And so he says, it is by him, if there's going to be that reconciliation, it's going to be by him, and it's available for all that are in the earth and, and the things in heaven. In other words, this reconciliation carries through all the way through to glory. Now, um, another thought that can be seen is that reconciliation will be finally uh, realized during the millennium, uh, in which the curse of sin is removed from the earth. But then he adds in verse 21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind. 
Now, every one of us, before we trusted the Lord, were alienated from the Lord. Some were deliberate, some more or less coasted into it, but still alienated in our minds from the Lord. Those that were deliberate, they would think on the idea of the Lord, and they would think on it inaccurately, and for whatever reason, their misconception of God, they chose to reject Him. But then most people, they don't purposely, willfully reject the Lord. They just coast in the, into this alienation, which began, of course, with the sin nature within them uh, from their birth. But they accept the teachings of the world, uh, evolution, and the things that reject God, and they eventually are blinded. So they are completely alienated. We, every one of us who are saved, were in that condition at one time. All unbelievers today are alienated from God. And so we recognize that we are the ones that are alienated. We're the ones that are angry with God. We're the ones that don't want God. We, we can get along just fine without Him for those who still do not know the Lord. Now for believers, of course, it's altogether different. He is speaking here of our condition and the condition of those that are still without the Lord. And our condition before we were saved. So he says, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind. The mind that excludes him wants nothing to do with him. Uh, there's a lot of nice folks at work. When I bring up the Lord, they change the subject. They don't want to talk back. Uh, they're good people. They good hard workers. They're, they're good friends. They, they're they're uh, pleasant to be around. They just don't want to talk about it. Um, they have, we are created with a capacity to choose, and they choose not to believe. Blinded by their sin, blinded by their religion, blinded by their education, or even by the influence of friends who object to the idea of needing, needing a Savior. All unbelievers are at enmity with God. They don't want Him. If a person will obey the light they have, God will give them more light. But they don't want to obey the light. They want what they want in their own lives. Even those that are religious, they, they are maybe very faithful <coughs> in their religion, and, but they're depending on their religion. They're depending on what they do instead of depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to reconcile them to himself. <coughs> Excuse me. Then he adds, enemies in your mind by wicked works. Now, all sin is in opposition to a holy God. Before we were saved, sin, wickedness is a reflection of that enmity that we have against him. Now, after we're saved, sin and wickedness can still come into our lives, but it is completely inconsistent with our profession of faith. If a, a leader in the church, a preacher, a deacon, or a, a teacher, someone in the church goes into immorality, they're still saved and they're still going to be in heaven. But the impact that, can, that is made on their families, the impact that is made on other believers, even on the lost who, who scoff at the whole idea. See there, they're no better than I am. And so consequently, going into sin is something that for a believer, still possible, still be saved, but it's grossly inconsistent with our profession. The insult to God of sin in a believer cannot be measured in increments of offenses as if, if in some kind of social protocol but whenever a, a believer chooses to sin, they are, in effect, reaching for the shackles of sin from which God has already freed them. They sidestep the promptings of the Holy Spirit, prompting them to flee the temptation that is there. And to choose to sin is to choose that which once reflected our enmity against the Lord. Now, for the believer, it's, it probably is not enmity in the same sense of the unbeliever, but it is choosing to allow the temptation to cloud their view 
of God. In other words, when a believer is tempted, they make the temptation greater than serving God. They, the temptation is such that Satan works in our minds in such a way that he maximizes the allure of the temptation and minimizes the value of serving God. The fact remains, the greater the opportunity, the greater the responsibility. David is certainly a good example of that. He was a man after God's own heart. Yet one night he made a decision to, to go into sin with Bathsheba. And when Nathan stood before him, he made it plain the magnitude of his sin. He said, David, you have despised the commandment of the Lord. You've despised the Lord himself. And you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme his name. And that's what sin does. Would that we as believers could understand the, the sinfulness of sin, the wickedness of being wicked, recognizing that God has given these commands for our benefit. And whenever we are tempted to sin, we must see it in the perspective of who he is and what he says. Because to fall into sin, to choose to sin, is something that certainly is opposed to who he is and to what he said. In fact, the Lord uses the word despise. David didn't think about the sin with Bathsheba in terms of, boy, the Lord shouldn't have told me not to do this. I don't like what the Lord did. He didn't think that way. He just didn't think about it at all. And in doing that, he despised it. And that is the nature of sin in the believer's life. But the fact remains, he has reconciled us to himself. We don't need to go into uh, temptation, into sin, into wickedness. We can live a life apart from that. Now, he says, he has reconciled us. Now hath he reconciled. He has provided all that is needed so that we can be reconciled to him. We don't need to sign a peace pact. We don't need to smoke a peace pipe. We do, we do need to trust him for our salvation, and he reconciles us to himself when we do. <laughs> Thus, we recognize how he brings us to peace with him, to himself. Now, there's a little bit of a conflict in, in thinking. Uh, when we think of what the Lord said in John 3.36, where he speaks of his wrath abiding on those who believe not. Uh, wouldn't this reconciliation be partly on him too? In other words, he needs to be reconciled to us as well? No, it's not. Because in the same chapter, he speaks of how he loves the whole world so much that he sent his only begotten son. In other words, God in his perfect balance of love and holiness, he loves to the point that he's willing to sacrifice his son for our redemption, but his holiness is such that his wrath does indeed abide on the sinfulness of the unbeliever. His holiness is offended by all sin, but his love reaches out to provide us a way to himself. In verse 22, he adds, in the body of his flesh through death. Remember the Gnostics of the uh, Colossian era? believed that he appeared to die on the cross, but it didn't really happen. That, uh, that at that point in time, his deity left him. He was just a man. And as far as that goes, it was just an appearance of death. And here, Paul is making it clear that the death of Christ was very real in the body of his flesh. The Gnostics claimed that the angels were higher emanations than Christ. And therefore, they were worthy of worship more than Christ. And here, Paul is making it plain that only the Lord Jesus Christ, by his death, could work for us reconciliation to God. None of the angels could do that. None of the angels could, could bring us back to the Lord. The Lord himself, Jesus Christ, offered himself to pay the penalty for our sin. So that if we would make the decision to trust him as Savior, then his righteousness is given to us. We are reconciled so that we can have communion with him. 
Now, beginning in the second part of verse 22, we see the results of this reconciliation, the confidence that we can have. He says, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, the order of God's work in the Colossians believer, first of all, the gospel was preached everywhere. They heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and believed on him, and thus they were reconciled to God, and they received the peace with God. They continued in their faith. And then, eventually, one day, he would present them to himself in all holiness, which he has done. But he begins at the end. He says the ultimate result of this reconciliation is to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now this is speaking of our standing before him. In that the moment we trust Christ as Savior, he gives to us his holiness. He, we are made unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And then when we are presented to him, that will be who we are. Now, in order to bring you before him as his bride, this has to be done. We can't come to him on our own. That which impresses him in the presentation to himself is not outward beauty. His desire is for a bride of holiness and righteousness that speaks again of our standing. To be holy means that every believer is made absolutely pure all of our sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Unblameable is speaking of being without spot or without blemish. In the Old Testament sacrificial lamb they, that the people would bring for their sacrifice had to be a lamb that was without blemish. They couldn't bring the lame and, and those with uh, scabs all over them and so forth. They had to bring a lamb without blemish, a value to indicate their love for their Lord. Further, this highlights the fact that we cannot make ourselves unblameable. We all have reason for blame. But the Lord says that he makes us unblameable. It's something we cannot do, but he does to us. Only the power of God can make us unblameable. Further, he uses the word unreprovable, speaking of unaccusable or unchargeable. Nothing can be charged against us. We are cleared of all guilt. No one can lay a claim against us, for he has justified us. He has made us uh, pure. Now, the accuser of the brethren, when we are presented to him, will be silenced. Uh, he will be silenced by the holiness of God that he has transferred to us because of the death of Christ. Now, our state is not this way. Our state is such that we need, we should have the child of God who understands this will be motivated to pursue holiness, will be motivated to pursue a life that is unblameable and unreprovable, but we haven't arrived completely there. Never will in this life. But our life should be characterized with a growing sense of holiness a growing realization of being unblameable and unreprovable as we learn to walk with the Lord. Verse 23 is something of a puzzle. Appears to be something of a paradox. When he says, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now, this is not a conditional clause based on future happenings. It is, not, it is not written in such a way that something shall be if something else is true. In other words, you shall be reconciled if you hold on to the end. That's not what he's saying. That's not what this if means. It does not mean if you persevere. If you persevere, if you hold on to the end, then you can enjoy the fruits of that reconciliation. It cannot mean that we could not hold on and lose our salvation because it's not possible to lose our salvation. Now, let me explain this. In, a, in order for a person to believe that they can lose their salvation, they have to explain away so many clear statements of Scripture 
in order to believe that. For example, what is the meaning of eternal life? How long is eternal? Until you stop holding on to the end? That's not what he said. He said eternal life. What does it mean to never perish? That's what he promised every one of his sheep. We will never perish. A person who believes they can lose their salvation has to just explain that away with obscure verses. The Lord says we are kept by the power of God, not by our strength, not by our uh, good works, but by his power we are kept. And when he says, if you believe, you have eternal life. Have is present tense. How do you explain that away? Philippians 1.6, where he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, there is no way we could ever lose our salvation. So what does this verse mean? Well, Obviously, it means something else because the principle of interpretation is you always interpret the obscure in light of that which is plain. In other words, if there is something that appears to be a contradiction, you look at the statement that is simply stated and start from there rather than one that, that is obscure. <laughs> there is no such thing as a contradiction in Scripture. God cannot lie in any part of His Word. So the question again, well then what does this mean? He did say, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. What is he talking about? This word if is the if of argument. It means that something was accomplished if something else is true. Our reconciliation is an accomplished fact. Today, we could say it this way, in which we would say, since ye are reconciled, then you will continue in the faith. Um, that is part of his work, completing all the way through to the day of Christ. Uh, his good work in us is such that he's going to continue. So this word, if, carries the, the sense or the meaning of, or, or if means since. Since you continue in the faith. In other words, you are reconciled. That is established. Now you will continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and you will not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. So we are grounded on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are settled by firm convictions of faith in his word. We're moved not away because he will keep us in the faith. Now, having said that, of course every believer knows we will be tested. We will have questions in our lives. There will come doubts into our lives. We may even, through some major disappointment, walk away for a brief period of time. But you will come to the conclusions of faith in return. You will not move away from the hope of the gospel. You will come to the conclusions of faith. A true believer cannot, cannot permanently walk away from the Lord. In fact, it's been said that backsliding of a believer is revealed in two ways. One thing is brevity, the time is short, and the second thing is the end of that backsliding when they repent and they return to the person claims to be a believer and there's 20 years of bitter rejection of the Lord in his way there if because of some major issue in their mind there's a huge question mark as to whether or not there is genuine faith a genuine believer will not move away from him then he adds which the gospel which you have heard which was preached to every creature he call it the hope of the gospel the word hope in the, in the scripture, particularly in the New Testament, is always used in the context of confidence. It's not wishful thinking like we use the word today, but it's speaking of an absolute established uh, confidence that is there. That confidence, that faith of the gospel which you've heard, the gospel is God's communication 
to them and to us that brings to us the gift of eternal life. And this gospel will, uh, will work in us in such a way that we will hold to that truth from his word with a great sense of joy. Notice he says, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. There is no reason to make this some kind of a, a puzzle. That statement just simply means that it was preached everywhere. Um, the persecution in the church in Jerusalem scattered believers all over the area. And the phrase is just simply a, a word picture highlighting the fact the message is out there, the gospel is out there available to all. Now, in summary, the alienation and enmity against God is evident in unbelievers everywhere. This is why loved ones and, and friends um, get upset with us when we speak to them of him and of his claims on their lives. It's why those who are depending upon their religion instead of Jesus Christ will get angry when you try to point out to them that that's not the way to be reconciled to God. That it can only happen when we make the decision to trust Christ as Savior. They are much more comfortable ignoring God in order to hold on to what they've been taught by their parents and religious leaders. <laughs> Thus, they're alienated from God by their religion. Just like we were before the Lord opened our spiritual eyes and we saw him for who he is, what he has done for us. In other words, he has reconciled us to himself. This is why he deserves the preeminence in every facet of our lives. This is why it is imperative that we seek to bring him glory in everything we do and say, in every relationship that we have, that we strive to honor him. Then he gives us this confidence that we will continue in the faith because of his keeping power, because of the absolute certainty of him keeping his promises and the confidence that what he started, he will finish. He reconciled us. He will complete his work in us. That's what he did. It's nothing that we did. The only thing that we could do is the work of believing on him. If you have made that decision to trust him, you are in fact reconciled and will continue in that faith, grounded and settled upon him. But this morning, as we look at what he says in these verses, we have one of two decisions to make. One is a decision to praise him for his work of reconciliation in us, rejoicing in the fact that we are reconciled to him, that we can commune with him. It never ceases to amaze me that God himself wants to commune with me. Because of his work, I can walk with, in communion with him. The second decision is this. If you're not sure that your faith is in the person of Jesus Christ, then I urge you this morning to seek out a believer and learn how you too can know him. And then learn to know him. Dearly beloved, we have reason to praise him because of the fact that we are reconciled to him. Let's bow together for prayer. Dear Father, we thank you and praise you for your awesome goodness. As we look at your work, the price you were willing to pay, to, be, to enable us to be reconciled to you. Dear Lord, it is an awesome thing. Help us to see it for what it is. Help us to recognize our need for Jesus Christ as Savior, and then our need to rejoice in that reconciliation that we would give to him the preeminence he deserves. I'm trusting you, Father, to use your word in each of our hearts to fill us with this joy, to make it clear 
what you have done, the magnitude of what you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, for your awesome goodness. In Jesus' name we rejoice.